yet another um, of our candidate interviews. And I have with me um, Victor and Odlovac? Yes, correct. Odlovac. Odlovac. Okay. So, pretty close to pronouncing it right. Um, and uh, you are running for EWEB. EWEB Commissioner at Large. Right. And we spoke to your two opponents, who are uh, Mindy and Zach, earlier. So, we've got everybody running for that office at this point in for an interview. So, to start off, um, where do you come from? What's, what, what was your early life like? Sure. I'll, I'll take you all the way back, just rather briefly. In case you can't hear it, I was born in Manhattan, New York City, okay. East Coaster. And, you know, I grew up there, and uh, I went to Stuyvesant High School, science okay. high school, and then I went on to Earlham College, a Quaker school in Richmond, Indiana. I studied physics and psychology, but main, mainly physics. Okay. And then when I thought about my first job, I said, okay, I'll be a high school physics teacher. And that was in Baltimore. It was Baltimore Friends School. Well, okay. the only, you know, Friends School in Baltimore. And I was actually teaching physics uh, 43 years ago. And after teaching there a year, I decided to try graduate school. And, you know, there are some very smart people distantly related to me, but I discovered the difference between bright and brilliant. I was in the first crop of measuring the gravity waves and the string physicists, but wow. I realized that other people do the problem in 20 minutes and I would do it in two hours and I would write down 120 steps and they would have only 12 and they would say all those 10 steps each time. You just do it in your head, man. It's like, oh, I better get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so I then I looked around and I went back to teaching again. I was teaching in another, you know, private school in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, right okay. outside of Washington, D.C., about, you know, 20 miles. They have a big racetrack there. If you, right. if you run horses, you know about it, race horses. And then uh, all my friends said, you know, teaching's not that secure, and you don't make very much, and you have to take all that work home. Why, why don't you try computer programming? I bet you could do it. So, yeah, I used to work with the PDP-11s and stuff oh, yeah. and the Fortran. He said, look, you just get a job, go to COBOL school. And so I did that for a couple of years. That worked out really well. And then I have this yearning to learn my mother's tongue and my family's tongue because, um, you know, we come from Germany. Okay. Um, five generations of our family are in Berlin. My great grandmother and great grandfather, they were the editors of, and they also wrote a lot for it. It was called Every Person's Encyclopedia, okay. Jedemann's Lexicon. Okay. So I come out of this tradition of research and culture, and this is great. So I, I went there over to Germany for two years, and I learned it. You know, in three semesters, I passed the test. I got permission to study physics, but I didn't study any physics. I studied anthropology and culture and just, you know, really interesting things. Mm -hmm. And that was 1979, and the Greens came to power in Germany. And I learned about, you know, atomic power, no thank you. Okay. Bicycle power, yes, please. And I was just like taken away, and I said, you know, this is the way I want to live my life. So then I came back to the States, and, you know, I continued in the computer field uh, 25 years, basically. I did, you know, programming for like 10 years, and then the last 15 years were tech support. And I worked with all different levels of, you know, knowing something or not knowing and all kinds of, you know, different people could be the head of the corporation, could mm -hmm. be a person in charge of marketing, could be a very techie person. And I, I had to know who my audience was and how I could communicate with them. Right. And uh, I was, you know, I got to learn a lot and use all my physics and mathematics. And one of the very last things that I want to mention in this computer work was I worked for a three-tier, and three-tier was energy forecasting for renewable energy okay. for wind, solar, and hydro. And I did tech support for this in English, German, Spanish, and some written support in Dutch. Cool. 
And so that is probably the closest thing that applies to you know, what is going on here. So an official polyglot. Y yes, <coughs> yes. <laughs> well, congratulations. It's, uh, you know, they, they have this joke that they say, um, you know, a person who speaks two languages is bilingual, and then three is trilingual, and four is a polyglot. Uh, what do you call someone who speaks one language? Uh, not very smart. <laughs> An American. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, but yeah, welcome, welcome to the to the interview. So, why are you running for uh, for eWeb? I oh. guess you've you mentioned a couple of things, but uh, is there any specific uh, thing that motivated you? Yes. So what happened was, you know, I wound up in the Northwest and I was doing tech support, and I'm. I mean, I'm ever so slightly into bicycling because I started bicycling in 1985, April, oh. in Boston. And um, I just loved it as a way of moving people, moving things. And I said, okay, that, that's the end of the car. And that was, you know, the influence of the German Greens. Mm -hmm. And they would have these big, huge bicycle demonstrations. And they'd be a kilometer long. And people just to get together for three hours and they have the kids and all kinds of contraptions on there and carrying all kinds of things and you know I never saw anything like that in the States so I've been into bicycling since 1985 and I want to call it bicycle vehicling because you say commuter that implies that you don't use the car on the weekends but I just do everything with bicycles I came here with bicycles I walk the talk and I really really want to lower that carbon footprint yeah. And that is my primary motivation. I want eWeb to answer the question, what are we doing to be like Germany? Why can't Eugene be at 26% renewable energy like Germany is? Mm -hmm. You have to remember, 1990, Germany had no wind industry. They yeah. hired a few Danes, they learned how to make it, and now Siemens is building windmills. Yeah. The, uh, well, they, Germany has is is near a coastline has a coastline and it also is near mountains and so that gives them a pretty good average wind speed it does um, yeah I, when I was over when I was over there I do remember it being breezy mm -hmm. so um, okay so you mentioned earlier you mentioned smart meters uh, a little bit uh, before we started and then energy forecasting when you were talking about your uh, job history and then the carbon footprint so is there one of those you want to start with? Let's start with smart meters. Okay. So two and a half years, I was on the committee called SUMA Northwest. Okay. That is the Safe Utility Meters Association dash Northwest of Seattle. Okay. And I worked, we did everything in our power talking to city council members to stop the rollout of smart meters, which is also known as AMI advanced metering initiative okay so it's a package deal it means you remove the analog meter which is guaranteed 40 to 60 years and replace it with something else that is guaranteed between 2 and 15 years max mm -hmm. and the smart meter is a lot more expensive and the smart meter puts out of work all of those meter readers yep. and then you need antennas for it and then you need software because you have time of use billing mm -hmm. and then I worked in the software field and tech support and for some reason you know you've paid with your credit card and the computer program has lost the first digit and it never told you and all of a sudden it's three months and your bill hasn't been paid and now your power automatically gets shut off because it could be shut off with a mouse click with smart meter. And this is just a bad way to do things. I mean, over automation is just, it's a horrible thing to do. And you don't want to over automate giving somebody power. Mm -hmm. If you were in a hospital and you had a mouse click for the heart lung machine, a mouse click for the dialysis machine, a mouse click for the heart machine, You'd say, that's outrageous. Well, we are doing that with smart meters because there are people at night who have the ventilator going or they may even be on dialysis. And, you know, we don't know and suddenly their power is cut off. 
There is another very well documented problem with smart meters is a lot of them burst into fire. But what was the fix for that? They put in a heat sensor. So if it gets too hot, the power is shut off. Mm -hmm. Again, what if you're somebody is on dialysis or on your mm -hmm. ventilator? So that does not solve the problem. Smart meters take a lot of more energy, time of use billing. They're easily hacked. It's a privacy invasion. The real problem is we want to get to 26% renewable energy. We want to follow Germany. Germany is not wasting any time on smart meters. So the inverter I have in my house, the solar inverter, I put it in a year ago today, mm -hmm. that's made by Sunny Boy. That's a German company. Right. And the uh, child of the parent company of the German company is in Hillsborough, Oregon, and they actually make those cells, mm -hmm. the solar cells. They, they've been doing that for literally 40 plus years. So that's where we need to be. That is what we need to support. So I got so mad because I, when I moved to Eugene, I immediately joined the uh, Families for Safe meters. Right. In fact, they invited me to the meeting in October while I was still in Seattle. I said, you coming tonight? I said, no, no, give me a plug. Yeah. And when I saw on that February 6, 2018, that they reversed it. So instead of automatic opt out, it is now an automatic opt in. Right. I got so mad, I said to Cindy, isn't one of these positions open? Yes, the eWeb at large. That was Tuesday evening. I still have the papers in by Thursday morning. Ten days later, I had the signatures. And the other thing is, or I didn't mention, I want to call them extortion fees. Because if you keep your analog meter, you will have to pay so many dollars per month as a penalty for supposedly bringing that person there to read your meter. And it's a one-time fee. It's on my website. The way it works now in Portland, $137 to keep your analog meter, $36 every month thereafter. That is far more than my electricity bill ever is with my solar. Right. And that, that's outrageous, four or 500 a year. And like, I mean, you know, Something works, and it's good, and it's sound. Why do we need to do this just so somebody can have the privilege of doing the mouse clicking to turn people on and off? Yes, it is a big effort, but, you know, it's nice to have people employed. It's just so dangerous when you over-automate. And uh, you, w you wouldn't think it was right in a hospital with mass clicks for each mm -hmm. of the patients. So why, why should that be right for the person? Well, a lot of the opposition to solar meters or, or to smart meters around here centered around uh, electromagnetic radiation. And I thought that that was one of the weaker arguments that they could make uh, on that. And I told some people in the group about, in, in the group about that years ago, and they weren't happy to hear it, let's put it that way. You know, some of the other arguments that you've made, I think, are, are somewhat more valid. But Eugene's pretty far along on that process. Do you know exactly how far it is? Or yes, I can tell you exactly. 4,000 meters are installed. Okay. Out of how many need to be installed? The amount that need to be installed, you know, they, they haven't or, really or given what? us exactly fi figures, but say 70, 80,000. Okay, so we're... We're maybe about 20% into the process, or not 20%. Yeah, it's a lot smaller. Four out, yeah, four out of 80. Yes, yeah, 5%. 5% of the process, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so 4,000 are installed. So there's still a long way to go. I guess it's still an issue. I was just wondering if it had ceased to be an issue yet, but apparently not. Yeah. And they have all those antennas and those stations and relays and... Uh, they, they are not publicizing, here is the antenna. They are not telling us. Yeah. Uh, they, um, they have a policy of eWeb of very intentionally removing analog meters and switching them over. Mm -hmm. Now, any digital meter is a problem because any digital meter, it's not going to be glass. It's going to be the, you know, it sends out microwaves inside mm -hmm. the plastic, yeah. and it's going to have the heat sensor on it. So I have a Netflix solar meter, which is a digital meter, set to opt out. But if there's a power surge and it gets too hot, 
my, I'll be cut off from the grid. Yeah. And so that, that is the real, real problem with that. You, we want to keep our analog meters plain and simple. We want it simple. Keep, keep it simple, stupid, when you, when you were a programmer. I don't know mm -hmm. if you ever did programming. But I got the greatest fool when for two weeks eWeb did not come. And I watched that meter spin backwards. And I turn on the oven. I said, well, maybe I don't need to cook it that long. I'd run the dryer. I said, no, screw Heck with a dryer. And it, you got to be personally collected with everything you moved in the house and you could go back. And it was just such a wonderful feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's what it's about. And uh, this is such a waste. This is just, you know, I mean, it's so stupid. I mean, why are we driving off the cliff? Look, all I'm saying, it's a really, really conservative position. Eugene likes to think, well, so smart. But look mm -hmm. at Springfield. Springfield is too poor to be stupid. Springfield, the electric rates are 40% cheaper. 40% yeah. cheaper. Mm -hmm. Springfield, you get paid equal when you buy and sell your generated power. EWeb, you get three cents when you sell it, and when you buy it, you must pay nine cents. But 10 years ago, eWeb bought and sold at the same price. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, it was $6.50. Now it's $20.50 connection charge. So, I mean, eWeb used to do it right, too. And there, again, I was started off in the beginning, but I moved here in 2015, and I called, wrote, and came in person and said, don't you dare remove that analog meter from my house. I had to look at 40 houses before I found one with an analog meter. They did not remove it, but they said, oh, we have to test it every two years to make sure it's calibrated. It, it was okay, but I mean, we never heard this argument before. And mm -hmm. there's, there's this desire, this internet of things to have everything up, hooked up, controlled, everything a mouse click, and you know, people have just gone so crazy with their mouse clicks, with their over automation, and we just we just got to end this nonsense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got uh, what is it, Alexa, and then there's on the Mac system, there's Siri, and all the rest of this. I mean, people getting devices, electronic devices that talk to them and regulate their lives. Um, okay, so smart meters, you're looking to make them go away if possible. Yes. Okay. Keep the analog. Just don't drive off the cliff. I know we've started a lot of work doing it, but mm -hmm. it's still a cliff. It's still a huge, look at Springfield. Yeah. 2013, Jeff Nelson said, no, bad idea. March 15th, 2018, I called up Jeff Nelson, had a 45 minute conversation, mm -hmm. went back and forth four times on the email. Have I misquoted you in any way? He said, no. Five years later, same decision. Why can't we be as smart? Why can't we pay equal? Yeah. Well, paying equal probably has something to do with uh, a lot of the contracts that they signed themselves into, which was sort of problematic. They did a bunch of um, uh, kind of out of public view contracts on, uh, on power. Okay, so en you, you mentioned energy forecasting. Uh, so what was that all about? So that was, you could actually go anywhere on the planet, yep. and they had all this NASA data from the last 40 years, mm -hmm. and you could say, oh, I want to have a solar cell. What will my solar energy be? What will my hydropower be? Mm -hmm. What will my wind power be? And we did all three. And it was a way, so if you were buying some land or you wanted to build a factory, mm -hmm. like maybe like you're building the Tesla factory and you want to find the place with the most solar to put your factory to get energy, well, that uh, you would, could That would probably it. be Arizona. Yeah. In, right. the, uh, in the continental United States. So, um, okay, so energy forecasting. Now, let's, let's talk about, about energy because the folks that you're running against, you know, we're looking at um, for example, putting out uh, charging stations for electric vehicles, uh, stuff like that. Um, and then also talking about uh, the fact that we had a uh, very high renewable rate at eWeb, and that's because we're in an area with a fair amount of hydro, which they invested in back decades ago. 
Um, any thoughts on, on what our mix of uh, energy sources should be and how, how we get to that level? Absolutely. Well, the first problem is the earthquake. Yeah. What is the best defense against the earthquake to have a distributed energy renewable system? Mm -hmm. So Fukushima in Japan, as of 2011, there are a couple of towns where they created these microgrids mm -hmm. and they use solar and small scale wind and hydropower and that's the best way to protect us. No. The problem with that hydropower, they say it loses only 5-10% in transmission, but you have to look at the diagram on my website. You've got all those step-up transformers, and you step it up to 345 yeah. kilovolts, and then you step it back down, and it's AC, and then you have the shunt capacitors, and it finally gets here. And when you do all that, and you think about the amount of money to build all that, compared to just having it on the roof, and by the time it gets to the bottom of Lorraine Highway, anything extra I generate is used by my neighbors, either for you know, air conditioning in the summer or for heating in the winter. Right. And it, it's, just, it's just so much simpler, and again, that's what we want to do. That's what Fukushima had to do in Japan after, and that's, we, we want to have that distributive energy. And, we want to think about the real cost. And even the way we, we get that, we should look at the physics of it because beginning in 1882, they have the high voltage DC, direct current transmission. Mm -hmm. And that is what goes underneath the ocean between uh, Denmark and Europe and United mm -hmm. Kingdom and Europe. And that was the very first thing. And when you have AC, you've got a lot more energy loss because the field is constantly flipping and that's generating a, it's, it's just a lot of energy versus if you just have a straight cable and direct current battery, you know, you're not getting all that energy but, loss. But trans, okay, but transforming the signal, for example, with AC you can do it with magnetics, with basically building transformers. And that works pretty reliably. Um, when you've got a DC system, uh, the higher the, the voltage, the less current you have to do for the same amount excuse me, of power. And so uh, getting up and down along the, the grid is probably easier and lower cost uh, by doing magnetics. How, you know, I mean, a, a DC grid's sort of a nice idea, but is it, is it practical? They use it straight across China from one end to the other. It's been used in Europe a long time. Okay. And with the same amount of power, you can, you can have twice the power in, in DC voltage. DC voltage, you've got one cable. Yep. And in alternating current, you have to have several cables. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's, that's true. So hadn't really given, given thought to that. This so comes from the Edison website. Mm -hmm. and I'm quoting them. It's, yeah. The link is all on my webpage. Yeah. So... But the issue, the issue is getting it up to that value, okay? I mean, if you're using, if you've got generators, um, the question, okay, the question is how do, you get, how do you move it up to that high voltage? In other words, uh, what is the technology that gets you the high voltage on it and then bringing it back down from that level? Yeah, well, we have to use some po quite a bit of power to get it up to that high voltage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, I'm not sure exactly what it is, if the, how yeah. they're doing it or where it's I, coming I, from. Or, but I just know, again, keeping it simpler with a distributive network, mm -hmm. if we're at that 26% renewable energy, I mean, it just make a huge difference. And we're still stuck on this kind of centralized thinking, which makes us very vulnerable. And we need to move to this 21st century distributive renewable energy network. Okay. Well, the distributed thing is, is essentially um, making small sources and placing them around. Um, so you're not transmitting the stuff for, for the distances that you would with a central power station. That's right. Or linking your central power stations together so that you can, you know, ship energy in and out of a region. Mm -hmm. So... If we're talking about uh, the sort of telephone pole system, you know, then it, it makes some sense to, to go DC at this point. It didn't 
because we didn't have the kinds of devices uh, mm -hmm. that you would need to, uh, you know, do this at the low level. But in terms of, of long distance distribution, um, again, I, I wonder at the cost of, of actually raising the voltage in order to reduce the current and getting it back down mm -hmm. on, um, on that. But I'd have to look into that further. Yeah, okay. So, um, okay, so mix of, mix of sources. Um, yes. So Eugene has the benefit that it bought into a bunch of hydro a while back, but there's not a whole lot more that we can manufacture. In other words, um, most of the, ri the larger rivers have been dammed already, and we're generating as much pop, pretty much as much power as, as we can get. So there's a rising use of, of energy, so how do we supply enough for, for folks? To, to meet the demand. So what do we do for additional capacity, I guess, is the question. Okay. Well, the, the first thing is conservation. Okay. And we can really cut the cost up front. And back when I was a student, as I mentioned before, in Germany in 1979, I was staying in a little studio apartment. It was double-paned windows. Yep. It was so well insulated. I never turned on the heat. It had southern exposure. I got all the heat from the neighbors around me. So mm -hmm. the consciousness in Europe, the energy is so much more expensive. So right up front, I mean, insulation is really, really important. And I think one of the places that Eugene could improve on, all those people who are renting and yep. all those landlords who don't insulate properly. Mm -hmm. And I think a landlord should insulate as good or better for their tenants than they do for themselves. And the only way to make this happen is we could have a policy something like, I'm just giving sample numbers. Uh, you, if you don't want to insulate, you pay a $600 fine. Mm -hmm. But if, uh, you know, let's do it this way. If you don't want to insulate, you pay $50 every month as long as that apartment, whatever building, is uninsulated. But if you want to insulate the apartment, then eWeb will give you $600 towards the insulation cost. Okay. So we reward them for insulating. But if they don't insulate, they get penalized. Because look, this is energy. If I put gas in your tank and you drive away and there's a trail of gas all trickling out, you will get really upset. Well, why don't you get as upset about the jewels? It's energy. Yeah. And the universe doesn't care whether or not it looks pretty. And we, we've got to follow the energy. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's probably a reasonable proposal. The, one of the suggestions that was made, uh, which, which I thought was pretty good, is uh, requiring that when uh, people buy a house or rent a house, that they're given information about how much the energy cost is for the house. That would be really good. So disclosure of, uh, full disclosure, so you don't come in and go, oh my god, it's not insulated when you have only limited due diligence in order to do this and you have to trust someone right. um, to discover that. You should be able to see the previous uh, clients' bills. You okay. know, not their names, but you should be able to see their bills. Yep. So I think that there's some, some validity there. Now, if we're talking about, okay, you were saying that the, the best way to get capacity is to reduce demand. Um, and I, I do agree with that. I think that, uh, especially at this point, you know, as we get further into retrofitting and fixing more things, then, you know, the, if you, in other words, if you can deal with the, the most cost-effective ones first, and then you can move on down to the ones that may be not so cost-effective, um, you still get a lot of bang for the buck. Um, and so, for the most part, reducing your usage is cheaper than generating more uh, absolutely, capacity. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, then, but once we get to the generating more capacity, how are you going to do it? What are you suggesting? Well, again, solar. Yeah. Um, we could, you know, I think we could have a reasonable goal of every third or fourth house in Eugene or establishment or business having solar on it. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of things downtown where the huge parking lots and they've got a hundred uh, solar, uh, you know, collecting sheets up there. Mm -hmm. 
And if you go to a place like the Tamarack Pool, and so we, we've got good examples. Right. We, we just need to, you know, expand that. Yeah, the city's been been installing quite a bit, quite a bit of solar, which I guess is good. Um, the question is, could it be done more cost effectively? Probably. Um, but one of the problems that we have here is again, people are still heating houses with electricity. Um, so heat pumps, I guess, is another place where, where we Those can go. Those ductless heat pumps work really, really well. Yeah. I got, you know, well, I got it from the green store, but a lot of people sell it, the um, D-I-A-K-O-N, but there's also Mitsubishi, yeah. all different bands. But they, when I moved into my house in South Hills of Eugene, yeah. it had the first generation heat pump and the new heat pump was literally 5% of the volume. Yeah. And we removed all the old ducts and got rid of the refrigerant fluid. And my bill was immediately cut in half. Mm -hmm. And then I went and got the Oregon uh, sheep wool that they use for making sweaters. What's not good enough for sweaters, it's right out in Tangent, Oregon, yep. on the way pedaling to Corvallis. I got that on the roof. And you know, all those things make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, so, so again, that brings you back to the issue of insulation. Insulation, it's so important. Do you go outside and not wear a good coat? Yeah. I mean, everybody knows what down and wool is in the Northwest. Yeah, so the, why don't we do it with our houses? The, the, other, the next thing is, is to be able to put some solar mass, or not hold solar mass, some thermal mass inside of the, the building because what you wind up with is these temperature swings, whereas if you put some thermal mass in... Like a trombo wall, yes. Uh, or, you know, you could even do... Um, I mean, globber salts will work fairly well, mm. um, but you have to keep that... You either have to put it in thin sheets or you have to keep it um, uh, stirred up, otherwise it settles in the bottom of the... Um, mm. Your tank and is not as as efficient. It develops a crust and mm. and is not as efficient anymore. So you have to keep it uh, uh, distributed among the water. So it's phase change salts, but that stores a substantial amount of energy over a fairly small temperature mm. differential. Um, so that's storage. Um, so how much do you think that? Okay, so there's what four four other members on the board at eWeb. How how well do you think you can sell these ideas to that group? You know, I have been talking to Frank Lawson for the last two and a half years several times ever since he came on and said every word I'm saying to you. Yeah. And I was really concerned about the fix of the census meters as they get to hot the power shuts off. I said, uh, Frank Lawson, do you have a database of all the people who are on a ventilator at night or a medical device? Mm -hmm. Do you have backup generators for them? Do you have dry runs? Do you have nurses, doctors on mm -hmm. call? Did you do any testing? Can you show me on a map the locations? And I got no answer. And that was really, really scary. Mm -hmm. That really, really scared me. Yeah. Because the analog meter is a built-in Faraday box. So if there's a power surge, you know, it's protected. The magnetic field inside a sphere, inside of this... Mm -hmm. If I put it on there, it's zero, right. you know? And the, those little plastic things don't have that property, and that's, you know, in Concord, you read about that shorting out when the power line fell on top of the other one. One was 50,000 kil, one the other one was 20,000, and then it made that huge surge. So yeah. that is a really, really big issue. And I, had, I hadn't thought about this in a while, but I had... Um, Back, in, back years ago, uh, I had a, a PDP-11 that I put together out of uh, uh, old surplus stuff. Those are cute machines. I had them in high school. <laughs> and, um, and I had uh, somebody writing a thesis on it. They were using it. And I get this very troubled phone call about um, it's, you know, it's, it's crashed and I can't find my thesis. Mm. And uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, you talk about somebody hitting a telephone pole. Literally, I get home and there's this telephone pole. Somebody, some drunk driver swerved wow. off the road, hit it, and it was lying across the front, the front lawn. 
and the computer was not very graceful when it uh, lost its power. Wow. So, but yeah. yeah, hitting a telephone pole, you know, if it came down at a slightly different angle, it would have taken off the corner of the house. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, yeah, reliability on these particular things, loss of power, uh, is a significant problem. Yeah. So, so the smart meters basically just give you more unscheduled outages, but there's still times when the power grid will go down. So at a certain level, what's different about a, a smart meter being disconnected versus the power grid going offline for whatever, you know, an ice storm or somebody hitting a, a telephone pole or whatever? Well, it happens a lot more with the smart meters. Yeah. I mean, why go looking for trouble? Yeah, I suppose that's true. Why make it so if it gets too hot, the power shuts off? I yeah. mean, it just, it's just we don't need to go there. We need to get back to the problem of reducing the carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And another thing that really disturbs me, forgive me if I'm speaking out of turn, so we are trying to sell, as of August last year, we're trying to sell our major share in the harvest and foot wind farm mm -hmm. and we're keeping the Seneca polluting biomass. We need to sell the Seneca polluting biomass. We need to keep our shares in the wind farm. Energy may be cheap now, but four or five years when all that fracking gas is gone, yep. the wind farm will become so valuable. I bought stock in Vesta and you know the I I lost quite a bit because it's plummeted 25%, but I know in 10 years it'll, you know, it'll be back up there. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, fracking. So that's basically, uh, we had, we we're sort of on the tail of the, of the declining um, energy production. In other words, we discovered stuff back 40 years before we dug it up. And then we peaked in the United States in 1970, I guess, and we're on the, right. on the tail end of it declining. Yeah. And so the fracking thing really isn't discovering new, new energy. It's uh, new energy sources. It's really just consuming that remaining tail very quickly as opposed to and over a period of time. fracking is so energy intensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It takes so much energy to get that gas, more than you're ever getting from it, and then if you factor in, you know, injecting all those poisonous chemicals and then it creates earthquakes and it makes houses unstable and... Yeah. So you get some subsidence, you, yeah, also, you there, also mess with the water I mean, there table. are places in Europe where they, they just won't touch that. Yeah. I mean, they're not doing that in Germany. There, there'd be a riot. I mean... Yeah. Well, I, I wonder, I don't, think, I don't think Europe has a lot of... Um, uh, energy under it, and yeah, I guess no. there's there's a, sort of the um, uh, North uh, North Sea oil uh, yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's Norway. Yeah, and then there's of course um, you know in the Middle East. Yeah, but I don't know that Europe has much in the way of ga uh, natural gas or oil yeah, under it, it at least it, that it they've doesn't. discovered. But uh, but I know the Germans because I lived there two years, yeah. and you know I. I talk to them all the time, my relatives, mm -hmm. my family. I read the, the news magazine, The Mirror, Der Spiegel, mm -hmm. as, as often as I can get my hands on it. And I know there would be an absolute riot. And the, uh, there are a lot of German people demonstrating there was just a forest in Poland that they wanted to log. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the Germans were involved in that occupation. And they finally, you know, won. And they agreed not to. It's one of the, you know, last European kind of, virgin forests and yeah exactly so I, I know their mentality you know mm -hmm. they really love nature and I know we really love nature too so um, yeah why we, we just have to remember that yeah I remember the first trip that I made to Europe I noticed this sort of mountain and what they had done was they had cut out for, for logging they had cut out these pie shaped pieces where they would look one more section every now and then and um, uh, they were just going around the mountain, and by the time they got to the starting point again, the trees would be ready to be logged again, which um, is not exactly something we do in the United States. Exactly. But they were um, managing their forest pretty well, um, or at least a, a number of areas that I had seen were managing it fairly well, mm -hmm. which was good. 
but okay, so um, carbon footprint. So climate change, real or a total hoax? You know, climate change is very real. Okay. I was 12 years old, and right. it was a PhD Columbia graduate student who substituted for the math teacher when they had to go out for whatever. Mm -hmm. And we all adored him, and we, we didn't give him a hard time. You just said, show us what you're studying. And he talked about his thesis, and he put up the equations, and, and you know, it, we, we just did. Yeah. And, and he would explain about the greenhouse effect, because actually it was a substitute for the geology class. And he goes, if there's anybody who, I was 12 years old, it's 1964, is there anybody who doesn't believe in the greenhouse effect? Well, they go to the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, and we got those greenhouses there. And, you know, we're just going to close them and close the window. We're going to put you in there in July. And uh, we're not even going to give you so, some water. And you'll be in there for two days. And if you're still alive after two days, you know, uh, do you believe in the greenhouse effect? So, I mean, the, those layers of gas act just like the glass in the Brooklyn yeah. Botanical Garden. And, I mean, it's ab absolutely obvious. I mean, yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, there's a couple levels of denial. One is that it's happening. The other is that we're responsible for it. And, uh, but the, the thing that I get, so there's, there's people de doing climate change denial. But at the other extreme, there's a lot of people who say, oh, well, if we fix the problem, we can save the planet. So my, my question to you, because I've had several people that we've had this particular discussion, is um, how far down would we have to put, push carbon dioxide to, uh, for example, save the planet, keep us from popping to a hotter temperature state? Well, you know, the Germans, the free50.org is, is very popular. And I, I agree there, you know, following the Germans and reading about it over the years. And uh, we're now... It's been about a year or two since I checked. I checked about a year or two ago, and I read 420 parts uh, per million. I think we're quite up to that, but we're getting close. Okay. Well, that's, that's what their Spiegel said anyway. Yeah. <laughs> there, maybe it was 410, 400, mm -hmm. but yeah. we're well over 400. Right. And when you're in Freiburg, Germany, which is one of my most favorite places in the world, where my grandfather and great-grandfather studied, um, you can actually see the ozone in the air, and you can see the parts per million of carbon dioxide and all the other pollutants. It's like a, a weather sign, and it's yeah. all up there right by the train station. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I mean, photochemical smog is, that's a, a different set of, of problems, but um, because carbon dioxide is pretty much transparent in the visible spectrum. Mm. but. Uh, the question, the reason that I ask this is I, I sort of maintain, you know, looking at the analysis that, that we passed the tipping point probably in the 1920s when the Arctic started to melt around 300 parts per million. So, you know, and it became fairly clear, I mean, the submarine data, uh, the Arctic uh, lost about 30 percent of its uh, thickness over the decade of the 1960s, specifically from when uh, the Nautilus went under the ice sheet and measured thickness uh, on, starting on August 3rd, 1958, and when the Queenfish retraced that journey in 1970. So what they did was somebody, well, when the, when the Nautilus went under, uh, they got stuck because as they went through the Bering Strait, the Bering Strait was iced over at that time. And there was, there's a, two areas with an island in the middle. Okay. And they tried to go under the lesser shallow of the two uh, channels, mm. and they got stuck. And it took them a while to pull the submarine back out. Mm. And then they went back under the other one. And by 1970, the, the Bering Strait was pretty much ice-free year-round. Yes. And so somebody said, oops, we've got a problem here. Maybe we should go measure the ice, which they did. And that was, uh, we can actually thank Al Gore for that, getting that information declassified. Mm. Mm -hmm. And um, so Al actually did something good, but uh, a lot of people, a lot of people are pretty negative on Big Al. But that's definitely something he uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, he helped us with. But that's, you know, fairly significant. That's two pretty solid data points that align directly along the, the thickness curve with, uh, that we have from the satellite data starting in 1978. So we know that the, it was melting at 320 parts per million because that was the average over the 1960s. So getting to, th if, it, if the Arctic is melting away fairly quickly at 320, what's getting down to 350 going to do for you? That's true. That's true. And, um, you know, this is a little bit more complicated. And it's not just the parts per million of carbon dioxide, but methane yes. is 30 times more of a heat yeah. collector than carbon dioxide. And we don't measure the parts per million of methane, and that fracking is releasing yeah. all that methane. So we, you know, we need a better number, we need better study. I have a lot of friends who are scientists, and they say, you know, St Stephen Hawkins, who died recently, is right, and we've got less than 100 years, and that's the end of humans on the planet, and um, perhaps it's better because the other species, you know, will, will not destroy the planet. Um, but I, irregardless of what it is, you know, we're not going to be really sure until we get there, and it's just the right thing to do mm -hmm. is to, you know, well, use as little energy as possible. Well, that, that's a moral argument, and a lot of people are not going to respond to that. So I, th I think the more valuable argument is an economic argument about the impact of, of climate change as it, as it happens. I mean, because the Arctic will probably be ice-free for a few days in September, you know, certainly before 2025, and probably uh, ice-free year-round sometime in the early 2030s. So at that point, it no longer buffers um, Greenland, okay, because the floating ice sheet in the Arctic doesn't, when it melts, doesn't change sea level. But Greenland's got 23 feet of sea level change sitting on it. And once the Arctic stops reflecting light during the summer months and starts absorbing, that's almost another petawatt. That almost gets fairly close to doubling the actual imbalance at this point. Mm. And so you're putting an extra petawatt in. If you, if you applied that petawatt of power directly um, to Greenland, it would melt in 25 years. Yeah. So, you know, once the Arctic is, is ice-free, then Greenland's going to start going pretty quickly. So yeah. by the end of this century, I mean, I, you know, assuming I last another 20 years, I'm probably going to see, you know, a couple of feet of sea level rise from the Greenland uh, beginning to melt uh, before, you know, the end of my lifetime. It's been very slow sea level rise. Mm. It's basically a little more than a foot over the last century. But um, that's going to be significant. It will be. Yeah. And, you know, my little Manhattan where I was born, they're very concerned about this too. Can, I want to say one thing because eWeb is also water. And my yes. na last name is Oblovac, and it means from the water in Slavic. Okay. And I have been volunteering for two years with Community Rights Lane County mm -hmm. to stop not just the aerial herbicide spray, but oh, just yes. the existence of a period, the atrazine, the Roundup, the 2,4-D. And those airplanes in Vietnam, they, they stopped doing the Agent Orange there, and they came here, and they sprayed T4-D, which is half of Agent Orange, and it's just horrendous that this goes on. And yep. we know this is so deadly because if I put a millimeter dropper in a water cooler, yeah. um, you know, I'll get 10 years in jail, felony, easy. So one part of the law knows how dangerous it is. The other part of the law says, oh, you're a helicopter, a million times amount, just do it as yeah. much as you want. And then we've got the state preemption. And as eWeb commissioner, here's what I want to do. I want to test that water every week. I want to go all up and down the Mackenzie. I want to find out when they're spraying. I want to go 24 hours later. Yep. I want to have people watching, watching the birds, watching the deer, because we have had several public Republicans. One of his name is Justin, and he was poisoned by all this spraying. He says, look, I'm a Republican, but my children got deathly sick. I'm a hunter. When they do the spraying two days later, I see the dead deer, and 
some of the deer that I've shot that weren't dead, but I can't eat them. And it's like, it's scary. And um, we know how bad it is. And all these commissioners that are saying, I'm getting a little far afield, excuse me, the county commissioners. No, that, I think it's that, very relevant um, because that, e Web is about the watersheds. Right. And that we're saying, oh, it's you know, not all right, and the laws and complication, and mm -hmm. we'll be preempted. It's like, hey, let's be real simple about it. Our job is to protect the people, protect the water. We find those heightened levels. We immediately go to the governor, to Kate, mm -hmm. forgive me, her last name? Brown. Kate Brown, like Jerry Brown, I should remember. Kate Brown said, look, we got the statistics right now. Mm -hmm. You stop spraying immediately immediately yeah and just like you know they did with the DDT when they finally realized it and we've got to do that we yeah. have got to do that for the people and you know the people in Cottage Grove all these little farmers they're working so hard and uh, they're they're friends of mine from all this community rights Lane County work and we've got to take seriously we got to be stewards of the water water yep. is life water is sacred yep and that is so so important to me no I grew up in New England, uh, actually in Connecticut, and I'm old enough to remember enormous flocks of birds that, you know, as they would, as they would fly as a, a unit, would darken the entire sky. I mean, and, I, and I'm sure that back in the 17 and 1800s that those flocks were even larger. I mean, that's incredibly rare to see even, you know, a thousand birds in a, in a, a flock rather than, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands like you used to see. Mm. And, you know, the spraying is a big component of that. The DDT, mm. the problem with birds and DDT is it softened the shells of the, the eggs and, and the, the offspring didn't survive. Mm. And so uh, we eventually recognized that that was a problem and, and banned it, thanks, you know, in, in part to Rachel Carson. But and specifically her book, Sol uh, Silent Spring. But we still have, you know, all of these particular issues. I mean, there's a jobs issue around um, if you can't spray, now you've got to hire some people to clear the brush off the edges of the, the highway. But you now have a resource because you can grind that stuff up and use it for fuel. Um, or you can, you know, use it for a variety of things. It's a useful, it's a useful uh, commodity. Uh, or, we ha or you have to send people into these log sites to thin out the undergrowth there, that kind of stuff. So, what's wrong with giving people jobs? Yeah, like what's wrong, what's with, wrong that? with that? I, I want to speak one more about giving people jobs. This is kind of very personal, but forgive me for being so personal. My father is 95, and he still got all his facilities. He was a little bit forgetful, but I said, Dad. You were the vice president of U.S. TAC out there in Spring Valley, New York, and while you were working there for 14 years, half the thumbtacks in America you made, and a large portion of the switch, the light plates, and the mm -hmm. things you plug in, all American made, and you're in charge of 200 people. Now, your salary in comparison to, you know, the average salary of the people working all those punch presses. I mean, I'm guessing it was maybe three, four, five times the salary, Dad. It wasn't ten times their salary. Or, or and, a thousand. And, yeah, and he said yes. And I said, look what is happening here in Eugene. I was guessing the average worker, say, is like to make it easier, maybe 28K yeah. at uh, EWEB, and we got the people certifying the, the ductless and you know, energy conservation, the meter readers. And Frank Lawson's salary is ten times that. And I, and my father heard that and said, that's crazy. I never made 10 signs. And he was physically responsible. He was the one they called up in the middle of the night. It only yeah. happened a couple of times for 200 people. So we've got this, and we got this really lopsided idea of, you know, disrespect of the work ethic. And, mm -hmm. and we, we, we've, we've got to give the people jobs. And, uh, you know, that's a nice thing. Enough said. I'd want to go on too much you know, about that. Uh, but I'd like I'd like to know how we're going to do that. That I think is is the key issue. You know, and 
all of these problems are heavily constrained and at a certain level we're probably near the optimum we could achieve uh, in most in most places but I, I think that there's room you know again room for improvement so how do you how do you change the marketplace okay I have to challenge you right there yeah. so again I look at Europe right mm -hmm. five generations of my family in Europe well, it's eight or nine if you go back far enough. But Netherlands, 25 years ago, Netherlands had a huge economic problem. And they passed a law. Every company, no matter what the size, by consensus, if the people agreed, everybody would stay working. And they would share the work. Yeah. One day a week, two days a week, three days a week, four days a week. Right. The average work week in Netherlands is 24 hours. Yeah. They have the highest percentage of any country in the world of people working just 24 hours. They get their, you know, vacations a little bit scaled back, but they can take them without pay. Mm -hmm. But they get all their normal benefits. And the people in Netherlands are really happy people. They always make it into the soccer every year. I mean, this tiny little country, mm -hmm. I mean, challenging Brazil. So, I mean, they're doing something right there. And we can use this ec word economics in a funny way to put one people, group of people against the other. But if we all share it, uh, I think we can all be really happy. Yeah. I think the, the American labor m movement um, deserves some blame for all of that. Because in Europe, um, what, when, when they were negotiating, they push less on increasing the, the wages and more on increasing the power that they had in the organization. You know, naming directors to the board of directors and, and getting a number of these kinds of concessions where they had some control, whereas in the United States they just went for wages and benefits. Um, but no control in, in, in the organizations. And so, yeah, that's where, that's where some of this, in other words, when the company says, ah, we're going to get up and move to China, in Europe, they don't get to do that because there's some directors named by the, the people who are going to be put out of jobs, and they're saying, ah, we got a problem here, guys. Uh, but that doesn't happen in the United States. So every company in Germany, 50% yeah. of the board is always the workers. Volkswagen, Siemens. Yep. Siemens started in 1885 with the first streetcar, mm -hmm. and they're still going strong. So they just can't do that. So it's, it's like being worker-owned, at least 50% worker-owned built in, yeah. because the people on that board are always half workers. Mm -hmm. And if they want to merge, it's like, no way. So it, and Mercedes didn't move to China. So we, uh, yes, true. So we've pretty much run out of time. Okay. So do you, have a, do you have a website? I do. It's convert2linux.com. Okay. You just remember that. That's okay. enough. I it's spelled C-O-N-V-E-R-T-T-O-L-I-N-U-X.com. That's okay. from my computer days. And you can ignore the geeky Linux stuff. But very, at the very top, it will say, click here to see eWeb Commissioner. And then once you've clicked there, you will see that this coming Friday, 7 to 8.30, at the Eugene Garden Club, 1645 High Street, almost on the corner of 17th and High Street. Yep. I can, we can hold 100 people. I'd like everybody to come out that can, and uh, we'll be there from 7 to 8.30. I will speak only 20 minutes, much shorter than I spoke here, and the other hour will be questions. And cool. I encourage anybody to come. And anybody is welcome, including the other candidates. Anybody is welcome. Please okay. come. Well, thank you. So it was a pleasure having well, a thank conversation. You, Joe. Thank, thank you and for having me. Good luck me. on your on your candidacy, and we will see you folks with the next meeting.